All right. So today we have D Dimitri Rayaboy. He is the VP of AI Enablement at Ginkgo Bioworks, and he's also a uh, an old acquaintance through the uh, big data Hadoop days, uh, but he has long uh, made that switch over to applying some of these tools to uh, biology. And he is, uh, as I mentioned, he he's at Ginkgo Bioworks and their tagline is biology by design. And they also describe themselves uh, or uh, describe this field in the following way and on their website, biology is the most advanced manufacturing technology on the planet. We program cells to make everything from food to materials to therapeutics. And with that, welcome to the Data Exchange Podcast, Dimitri. Thank you. Thank you. Glad to be here. So um, let's start with the basics. So what is what are the kind of the applications of uh, the field that you folks are in, which I guess roughly is, we might call it synthetic biology. So what are the practical applications? Yeah, uh, applications to many industries. So probably the biggest one uh, in terms of public awareness, as well as uh, dollars um, is in the therapeutics, right? So think about um, vaccines, uh, think about antibiotics, and other things that are created by nature uh, and we use for healthcare. Uh, there's also a lot of sort of uh, other things around that uh, delivery agents. Exactly um, how you uh, package up the vaccine, you know, it's how you manufacture different enzymes that are required for that. All kinds of things that go into this, uh, but also applications in um, industrials, uh, different kinds of. Uh, materials and chemicals are being made by fermentation, by engineering organisms to secrete um, the, or to create the molecules that, that you want, um, as well as agriculture. Um, so think fertilizers or think, uh, uh, in some cases, engineering organisms, but in many cases, the what you're actually doing is engineering, like not the plant necessarily itself, but uh, some sort of collection of microorganisms that will work on the root system of the plant to capture nitrogen, for example. Uh, that's okay. a that's a real thing that's out there. And so, uh, people who are familiar with genomics know about DNA as a source of data. So, mm -hmm. what are some of the data sets that you folks work with? So, there's uh, a wide variety of data sets. Probably the biggest one in terms of kind of the raw data uh, is. DNA. So DNA sequencing, you sequence all kinds of microorganisms, you sequence different uh, uh, humans for therapeutic reasons, uh, uh, other members of the animal kingdom. Uh, that's DNA. Then DNA gets, uh, uh, this is like back to eighth grade, I suppose, uh, DNA gets uh, transcribed and uh, it turns into RNA. RNA uh, uh, turns into proteins. Proteins can do all kinds of functions, but there can be building blocks, um, they can be like transport agents. They can also be catalysts for chemical reactions um, that need to happen. Uh, uh, so uh, all of those you can get sequences for. DNA is composed of, uh, in, in the digital world, we can think about it as four letters. This is the vocabulary. Um, uh, proteins are made up of 20 amino acids. Um, so that's your that's the size of your dictionary. Uh, then there's also all kinds of observational data, right? So you have microscopy, uh, you take pictures of cells, uh, maybe you take video of cells, how they divide, how they grow over time. Uh, there's all kinds of uh, uh, mass spectrometry. There's all kinds of different ways that you sort of use to analyze what's going on with the cell, what kind of reactions are happening, what is it making, um, how groups of cells grow uh, or ferment, um, different growth curves, things like that. So it's uh, it sounds like it's inherently multimodal. In uh, some ways, yeah. And and so set aside gen generative AI and large language models. So what what are the applications of conventional machine learning in this space? Yeah, uh, all kinds of design of experiment. Uh, this is the. Is it machine learning or is it statistics uh, kind of discussion, right? Uh, but 
uh, it, there's a, it's a very large uh, design space. So design of experiment uh, becomes very important. All kinds of statistics for uh, everything you get in terms from the experiments is very noisy. Um, so there's uh, all kinds of things you do to take care of outliers or to normalize data, make sure you have the right controls, things of that nature. Um, then as we get into, and you, you use different approaches there, pure statistics or uh, pure, sorry, showing my biases. You can use Bayesian as well as yeah. kind of your more regular statistics. Um, and um, uh, then there's all kinds of sort of stats or ML used to uh, pick which winners out of many experiments you want to advance to the next phase. Um, there's all kinds of recommendations that you can do for like, essentially what piece of DNA to perturb next or pieces. You usually do it in kind of big batches. Um, uh, there's applications of ML kind of all over the place. Uh, recently with the emergence of uh, AI and LLMs, people have started talking a lot more about uh, generative use cases of ML. That's a little bit more new, right? So design so, a protein for me kind of thing. So then uh, in terms in terms of generative AI, so um, is the idea you would need your own foundation model. So you would need either a fine-tuned version of, of a public or a proprietary LLM and then fine tune it and then and then what so what do you do yeah so first off i think we start talking about llms and most people are thinking uh you know gpt right or 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 llama or something uh, those definitely have their applications and uses and we use them uh but when we talk about llms for biology we're talking about the language of dna or the language of protein right so just to be clear you're not typing in unless you're doing some sort of hybrid thing, you're not typing in, give me a protein that does X, right? Like you're essentially inputting uh, sequences like a protein backbone um, and you're prompting programmatically the model to give you variations of it that optimize some objective function, right? So yes, you either have your own large amount of protein sequences or you take publicly available ones, you train an LLM on it and that somehow it figures out uh, uh, kind of the world of proteins or, or DNA and how the internal structure of it. Uh, and then you fine tune it uh, on specific particular tasks like predicting certain values uh, that you have uh, observed experimentally in a number of sequences. You can fine tune on that to give you more predictions. And so you use the LLM as sort of a mechanism for uh, generalizing uh, uh, beyond the sequences that you've tested. Right. So is is this world similar to kind of the regular LLM world in the sense that uh, you have proprietary models like GPT and Tropic, and then you have open source ones like Llama and Mistral? Um, yes, although not, uh, I mean, the, the natural language world, uh, everything is much bigger. Uh, mm -hmm. There is uh, a number of sort of well-established open source models that uh, most people use. Uh, commercially, a lot of people use them off the shelf with a little bit of fine tuning. Um, there are a few folks uh, training their own models, uh, uh, but largely right now, open source, I would say, dominates. Um, and so, the, so what size are the models in this space? Uh, it, well, you mentioned the the, the, the space is multimodal. Uh, it really depends on which kind of which kind of models we're talking about. There are a few areas where uh, a few million parameters um, is plenty sufficient to get state-of-the-art results. Uh, there are others where we're looking into billions. I think the largest uh, the largest protein model I've heard of is in the 100 billion parameter range. Um, it's much larger than anything else people use. The uh, Commonly used ones uh, are in the single digit billions or maybe like 650 million kind of uh, parameter range. That's for uh, proteins. For uh, DNA is DNA is more complicated. Uh, the models there aren't as mature. So, so uh, if someone wants to go about and train a foundation model uh, in this domain, mm -hmm. so. It sounds like uh, the barrier is not so much compute because you can get by with smaller models. 
So it's the barrier data? I think the barrier is both. Uh, and um, this is a theory. It's not uh, necessarily proven out by practice. I suspect one of the reasons for the smaller size of models is because a lot of them are created uh, by academics or they're created sort of as an output of a research lab at uh, at Meta or, or, or someplace like that. Uh, so they're... I mean, DeepMind and Meta aren't exactly compute bound, but mm -hmm. a lot of the academic labs to some extent are. Um, so you just see much, many more uh, smaller models. Uh, uh, that said, uh, I think, yeah, the limiting factor is data. Um, there is a fair amount of publicly available data, uh, but uh, it would be great to have a lot more. What we cover is only a small sliver of the total space, um, especially it's actually not necessarily even the sort of protein sequences or DNA sequences. The cost of sequencing has dropped from um, something like it was several million, maybe maybe even a hundred million dollars to sequence the human genome back in the year two thousand when the human gene genome project uh, finished. Uh, now it's like a thousand bucks, right? Like it's just dropped so incredibly. Um, it's extremely high throughput uh, and it's very cheap. So getting the DNA. Um, is not that big a problem as long as you can get diverse sources to, to actually sequence. Um, it's the sort of getting the labels that's really hard. That is very much a limiting factor, right? With human language, you can sort of, you can generate a bunch of pictures of cats and you can have humans say, that's a good cat, that's a bad picture of a cat. You know, this cat has five toes. Um, it's much harder to generate a string of DNA and have a human say, that's a good string of DNA, right? What you need to do is print that DNA, that costs money. You need to like run some experiments to actually assess what that bit of DNA does. And so your sort of per unit of data cost is one, it's much higher than for for language or images or things like that. Um, and uh, it's much more latent because these experiments take time, right? You can take weeks, uh, maybe even several months to get the data back. That, that's rate limiting. Most people who are training these models are evaluating them on public data sets. So they, they can't generate their own data or they generate very small amounts of, of data by sort of outsourcing it to labs. So there's no way to use a model to uh, uh, kind of uh, do the labeling, so to speak. So in other words, here's a bunch of uh, candidates and then I pass it to a model. The model will tell me, oh, those are good. Um, well, yes, but you'll be only as good as that model, right? And if we're yeah. trying to push the edge of the model, uh, we don't have like GPT is four so much better than everybody else. You can just use it as a label for all your open source models, right? But we don't have. You first need to build GPT four. <laughs> right, 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 right. So then, uh, uh, in terms of uh, LLMs and Gen AI in this space, uh, how real is it, or is it, or are people still in kind of the exploring? Let's play around with it. Yeah. We don't actually have use use cases or actual applications yet. Um, uh, it's very real in proteins. Uh, uh, there is a lot of commercial success with that stuff. We use it uh, actively uh, at Ginkgo. Um, uh, that stuff works. It's not exactly sort of the sort of science fiction or maybe scaremongering uh, scenario that um, you, you might get from sort of popular literature where. You know, you just type in a description of what you want a protein to do and out it pops. But uh, definitely the, uh, be it LLMs or sort of diffusion models and other deep learning, let's say, uh, approaches are very effective in and growing uh, very rapidly, uh, both in adoption and in advancing in terms of how good they are designing proteins. Uh, so there are specific instances where... Uh... This has led to like a commercial application, like a drug or the use of LLMs, I mean. Yeah, um, the drug pipeline is very long. Uh, so the drugs that have that are now in sort of late stages of testing would have been designed in like 2015, 16. Um, so, and it's, and it's a drastic cut down also. So uh, right now, I, 
I couldn't tell you the exact stats, but uh, I think there was like a couple that were furthest advanced and they just fell out like at the very end of uh, uh, of testing. But uh, nonetheless, it's uh, clear that as a methodology for selecting better candidates, this is this is definitely a, a meaningful approach. And of course, it's working in tandem with like other science. It's hard to say that any particular uh, protein or drug candidate or something like was that designed by AI or not? Because the way you work with it is sort of it's one of your many tools and many hands are involved. So in some ways, everything has been built by ML that's come out in the last decade. And in some ways, well, none of it was de novo, just it popped out of a computer and you sent it to the FDA, right? So it seems like this, this is a domain where the stakes are higher, right? So mistakes are more serious. Ethical lapses are more serious. Uh, security breaches are more serious. So mm -hmm. are there specific things that you folks in this domain are doing differently than the rest of us to, hmm. mitigate, to mitigate these risks? I I think so. I have to be careful to say that this is like personal opinion and not my <laughs> the company's opinion. Um, uh, Ginkgo has a, a whole wing of biosecurity that thinks very deeply, much more deeply than I, about uh, generally dangers of uh, be it natural biology, which is doing you know many orders of magnitude more experiments per day than humans are. <laughs> like by the way, it's engineering organisms all the time and trying to kill us. Um, but uh, uh, so this is personal opinion. I think um, there's. A lot of fud being spread about sort of the capabilities of AI, um, uh, and particularly AI and biotech, because it's sort of we all grew up on the 80s sci-fi, and like this is close enough that we can leap to you know Terminator scenarios. Um, so I think we need uh, you know ethical oversight, regulatory frameworks, all of that stuff, but less on like tools and methods and, you and, use and more on the outcomes. And those also already exist anyway in your domain, right? Well, they exist and need to be continually refined, right? Like the field moves forward, what's possible becomes different. But I think we need to focus on what are you doing with the thing, not, you know, how many parameters are in your model, right? Like you shouldn't be doing, I don't know, uncontrolled gain of function experiments regardless of whether AI is involved or creating viral agents or like working with harmful chemicals around uh, around people who shouldn't be exposed to them, regardless of whether AI is involved, right? Um, and any kind of safeguards we have for, for that work, I think should also apply to output of AI. But um, I don't think we're in a world right now where one errant scientist doing something uh, you know, the uh, unthinkingly will create a robot that will, will suddenly reveal, uh, release, you know, the new COVID upon the world. Um, I think it's just much harder to go from computer to the thing actually works <laughs> than uh, than people imagine it is, even with all the advantage, uh, breakthroughs that have happened. So the public foundation models have been trained on scientific journals as well, right? So, uh, yeah. So then... Uh... To what extent are they, so how how useful are they in your domain? Um, they're pretty useful. They're pretty useful um, often in sort of, so in several ways. One, um, this is just such a multidisciplinary field, right? You have biologists and chemists and there's a lot of subspecialties. You have software engineers like me who don't know, you know, a protein from an enzyme from a ribosome. Um, so uh, it's they're very useful in terms of just making knowledge uh, closer to your fingertips uh, and being and, and helping with some um, the same kind of use cases that we the non biology people have for just augmenting your knowledge um, or looking things up or. Uh, and, and things like that. There are also uh, specialist uh, models that have been specifically trained on um, either medical literature or scientific literature. The, so MedPalm uh, 
MedPump2 now uh, is one from Google. Um, there are others um, that really help with the research because a lot of research, a lot of day-to-day -day work for scientists is actually look up a hundred papers that might be relevant to your problem and read what's in them, right? Uh, this is obviously a, a perfect use case for sort of a natural language LLM that will make that task much more, both improve your recall um, uh, and just make it much more uh, time efficient to get the right stuff. Do you, do you folks uh, train your own or use uh, any of these text-to-image, text-to-video models? Text-to-image or text-to-video? Um, you know, like DALI and... Uh, I mean, we do in the marketing department. Uh, yeah, I, so, I don't so know there, that... So there's no... Like a, here's a here's a prompt and then give me like a some molecular structure. I see what you mean. Uh, so not those, uh, but the technology that's under Dolly or stable diffusion and things like so diffusion models are actually uh, one of the main ways that people uh, design proteins. Um, same basic. But they idea. have their own. They have their own. But they don't create images, right? They create a protein structure. It's 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 a different yeah. actual output, but the fundamental kind of kernel of what's going on um, is is the same sort of diffusion approach. Um, interesting, interesting. Yeah. And um, what about security? Anything special that you folks are doing around security? Around like biosecurity, or just uh, you know, I mean, the the data sets I imagine are much more. Uh, important. Mm. Uh, I'd say our security. So first off, thankfully, even though we some we, we will work with companies that are doing things like developing therapeutics, we are not working in individual genomes, right? So uh, there's all kinds of like HIPAA concerns and others that uh, many uh, biotech companies will experience because they're sort of working directly on on people's genomes. We we don't. We mostly work on microbes. Um, they have a lot to your clinical rights. Um, uh, obviously, we have kind of normal IT security and and data egress controls and all of that stuff. Uh, I don't know that there's anything particularly sort of AI interesting in 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 that domain. So we do you... a little bit of like checking for is this string a piece of DNA that we care about um, kind of oversight, but so Dimitri, for someone who's uh, proficient in AI, LLMs, and things like that, and they want to make the jump over to your domain. When you interview such a person, or when you try to encourage such a person, so what what pieces of advice do you give them? Um, first off, what what I look in folks like that is evidence of uh, being able to absorb new knowledge really quickly. Uh, it's over, I've been doing this for seven years, probably in this field, and it still feels overwhelming. And it, you know, not a month goes by that I don't find out that something that I thought was a rule in biology is actually not a rule, <laughs> because biology is just full of exceptions. Uh, there's an absolutely overwhelming amount of new stuff to to learn. So I'm looking for folks who are um, not overwhelmed by that, by excited by that, and you know, they maybe have a history of of doing that sort of thing. Um, uh, Ability to communicate with both specialists in your domain, but also specialists that were also translate um, is really important. Um, but in terms of sort of encouraging people that they will be able to make an impact right away, uh, one thing I would say is really in practice, one of the most important skill skills isn't some sort of like magical insight about biology or even magical insight about AI. It's... Um, there's a lot of need for building systems that organize data, move data around, um, make things repeatable, make things scalable, set things up in a sane way such that a group of people rather than one specific individual um, can work together. It's pretty, it's stuff that we encounter all the time in sort of the consumer internet space, you know, building, uh, I was a Twitter data, for a Data while, platforms. So data awesome. platforms, ML platforms, ML ops, data engineering, right? Like if you have those skills, they you will find a home. Like those are extremely in-demand skills here because the instruments spit out a lot of data. That get the data gets analyzed. It's sort of multimodal, very different kinds of data. You need to think about how to capture it, how to make it discoverable, how to make it useful, how to build the pipelines, all of that stuff.
So wait a minute. So you guys are building all of this on your own. So why not use uh, something like Databricks? And full disclosure, I'm an advisor to Databricks, but you know what I mean. So uh, yeah. So do people uh, in this field kind of uh, uh, shy away from using some of these other tools? So I I don't know necessarily about uh, Databricks specifically. Certainly, um, you try to leverage as much as you can, right? Um, uh, in some cases, it may be Databricks, it may be something a little bit more specific to to Bio. Um, you know, we uh, Ginkgo announced recently a deal with Google, so we're trying to make Vertex work. Uh, but all of the, I mean, there's a reason that so many engineers uh, have Databricks on their resume, right? Like it's not exactly. You still have to know what you're doing. It's a right. great set of tools, but you need to you need to set it up. You need to know the nuance. Yeah. You, know, you need to be able to tune it. And uh, what about uh, so for those of us who aren't in this field, the one headline that we all know about and remember is AlphaFold. Oh yeah. So how does this fit into Gen AI and everything that's happened in the last year? Because AlphaFold seems like two years ago. Yeah, even longer than that. I think yeah. that may be alpha full too, if not three now. Um, uh, so alpha fold solved. I don't want to say exactly solved because you know we, we keep moving the uh, the ball forward, but uh, made a massive leap uh, uh, in terms of the ability to predict uh, folds of a protein. So given a, a sequence of amino acids predict what the 3D structure will look like, essentially. Um, that's a very important problem to solve. Um, it also solves it sort of better for some classes of proteins than others. And there's been a lot of work on sort of filling those gaps and figuring out how to do more of that. Um, but that's, uh, once you are able to answer that question, you get 10 more questions that you build on top of that, right? Like, okay, now that we have this fold, what I actually want is um, what will have high binding. So like uh, th that protein needs to bind to something else. How do I design something that will bind to that target, right? Now that I can predict the folding and so on and so forth. There's just a lot of, like with any difficult enterprise, it's the sort of thing where you scale the mountain and realize you're standing on top of a hill and there's another mountain in front of you. Um, so uh, AlphaFold was a, fantastic breakthrough in a problem that was like long standing and now and then there are open source alternatives now and, and other things for for that problem or different variants of that problem and we're able to just think about the next set of problems uh, and once we solve those we'll think about the next set of problems and the next set of problems right like if right now we're just talking about fold a single protein you know imagine how many proteins there are in your body imagine that they are all interacting with each other they're interacting with all kinds of external uh, uh, actors and chemicals and microbes and and the whole complexes like there's just it's it's a fractal ball of complexity there's no end to it um so we just we just keep going keep solving the next problem so uh the landscape of uh players in this domain so if you look at for example the llms and foundation models and nlp in general uh it seems like now we're down to a handful of groups who can build the foundation models Everyone is fine tuning on top of it. Academics are largely outgunned by uh, industry players. Mm -hmm. So, in in this domain, so is it more a little more uh, level playing field, or you still you also have a concentration? Uh, you know, I think right now it's a little bit more like the NLP space before. Uh, GPT three, so you can still you can, there's still room to participate somehow. I think there's there's a lot of activity and there isn't some sort of like obvious runaway winner. Yeah. Um. Uh. And there's a lot of like the people on the inside are very excited and they're working on it a lot, but it hasn't leapt to that sort of everybody just recognizes the value and, and the promise that happened when uh, ChatGPT essentially came out, right? The, the killer app hasn't happened. Um, so I would say, yeah. Uh, or it sounds like from what you say, you can still build like a small foundation model and that can be impactful. Uh, and Yeah, for specific problems. Yeah, yeah. It, it'll be impactful. The hope is that the 
GPT-4 equivalents will emerge. Um, and we may be in a world then where it's 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 compute bound and, and you just need the resources. Then again, that technology keeps marching. And I've been very impressed with how quickly um, computational biologists adopt like they keep a very close eye on on what's happening in NLP and and vision uh, and 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 similar fields, uh, and how quickly they bring in innovations from there and apply them to biology. So as all of that is moving forward, uh, biology will probably also move fairly quickly. Uh, so that will drive down the cost uh, of developing these. Right, like if you look at mamba or or hyena um, that claim to be able to train much smaller models uh, at a fraction of the cost that have comparable performance. Uh, I mean, jury is still out. Like it, it needs to, obviously there's a lot of evaluation to be done. Um, but as these kind of innovations happen, they will be pulled into biology. And it's not necessarily the case that sort of uh, just access to compute would be a permanent mode. It seems like this is so. You, you think? Do you think that this will um, make these areas a lot more accessible in the following sense? Uh, is, so, for example, uh, as you mentioned, ChatGPT is the killer app because it's super accessible. Anyone can type anything in there and find value. Yeah. Uh, but in 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 the case of your domain, it seems like you still need specialized knowledge. Um, so even if you build a foundation model inside a company, there might only be a few people using it because it still requires a lot of uh, yeah. scientific knowledge. So do you think that uh, there's a scenario where these tools might actually make it even more accessible so that more people can participate? I think, I think uh, yes, but for sort of a, a wider range of scientists, like I don't know that sort of the proverbial man on the street uh, would be uh, will be GPTing them some new proteins anytime soon. Um, but uh, I think yes, the we, we want to drop the barrier to entry, um, uh, but more to sort of there's a, scientists specialize a lot, right? So somebody who focuses a lot on, we've been talking about proteins, so on protein design maybe isn't going to be as effective at uh, designing DNA regulatory elements, right? But they have a lot of knowledge that is sort of very close to it. So how do we make it easier for them to do some tasks uh, in, in that adjacent field? Uh, I think um, that is likely. And, and we do see a lot more people sort of being able to do more advanced things that before required absolute experts in the field. Now it's sort of, if you have a PhD in the field, I mean, there's, I mean, it tells you how, like what the level of expertise you need. And I say absolute expert, I don't mean a PhD, like a PhD is just an expert. Um, but with sufficient background, you're, you, you're able to, to use these things to where before you needed sort of one of the 12 people in the world who understand this stuff. Right. But uh, do you think that uh, someone who's, uh, you know, like an enthusiast, and yeah, maybe not even majored in biology in college, but uh, loved it in high school and and really kind of uh, uh, reads about it, but never yeah. really took formal classes, but now has access to some tools, might be able to participate. I think there's absolutely, especially in the sort of, uh, we know about this interesting approach to, let's say, fine tuning or to do to doing inference or to doing modeling, I don't know, regression. Um, there's a lot of available data sets um, uh, available commercially as well as non-commercially. There is a ton of data on the internet. It's, uh, you, and, and, you know, of course, compute, you can just buy or Google basically gives it away for free to some extent. Um, and uh, there's definitely a lot of room for participating and uh, creating new uh, approaches, testing them out, uh, analyzing uh, what's going on. One of the biggest, um, we, we haven't touched on this, a big kind of difference between uh, deep learning for bio versus, uh, say, natural language is that in natural language, we understand the rules, right? Uh, what we're trying to do is get the system to understand the rules we uh, intuitively understand ourselves. Maybe we can't describe them exactly, but we understand them. In biology, there's some rules we've figured out, but there's a lot more rules we just don't know. 
right? There, how things work is actually more or less a mystery, even to people with decades of experience in this stuff. Like they know some stuff, they've shined a flashlight on that one spot, but there's a lot we just don't understand. Um, so the hope with models, deep learning models for biology is that the kind of rules that they discover will help us learn, right? So explainability becomes a huge thing. Um, and of course, there's a lot of research right now going on in explainability. Um, the the work from Anthropic um, that they published, what was it two months ago now? Um, I don't remember the name of the paper, but uh, towards monosemanticity, I want to say. I may have butchered that. Um, that's really interesting where they essentially, how do you interrogate the model uh, to understand what are what it is that it is identifying. A really interesting thing in biology is that because we don't know the rules, it's less about what is identifying it, does it make sense, but more like what is identifying, is this actually a thing that we can use as inspiration for some follow-on experiments to actually discover something about how biology works, right? So I think there's a ton of open space there, research into discoverability, into how do you build uh, explainable models um, is very transferable, uh, and you don't need you know 100 billion parameter models for that. And and uh, so, uh, is there a way to do the experimentation uh, in a simulation rather than a, in a in an actual physical lab? So, in other words, uh, you use these tools to get inspiration, but then if the confirmation requires like a month long experiment in a lab. Yeah, that, that's kind of a killer for your workflow, right? If you want to have impact on the physical world, at some point you're going to have to touch the physical world, yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, that yeah. is that is no, true. No, but I mean, to reduce to reduce the the number yeah. of experiments. Yeah. Yeah. So I think, uh, in terms of like how does a sort of autodidact with access to a computer can have impact on the field? I think one creating models that are. Uh, doing better than state of the art or doing it faster or somehow moving the state of the art for uh, any kind of uh, detection uh, or classification, other tasks um, is great. And, you know, that's possible to publish. Um, uh, in terms of this and proposing new models that show that like we can given a known rule, like we can observe it, here's an unknown thing, we should follow on with experiments, like that's definitely possible. Uh, I think fundamentally, like it's, in order to actually provide that you discovered a new thing about biology, you, you can't do it just in, in silico, you have to go to the lab. Uh, but you can propose it, right? Like, and there's plenty of people with access to labs, if, if a discovery is, uh, interesting enough, who will do it? Like we've seen it with the uh, um, room temperature superconductors, right? <laughs> People yeah. started trying it. But you can at least uh, reduce the number of experiments by uh, if you had a model that really identified the high likely. If you have a strong hypothesis, right? Yeah. Like you know what you're going after, that's uh, that's valuable. Yeah, and so then uh, on the explainability front, are there specific things? there that you folks at Ginkgo are working on? Uh, I think right now we're looking at what other people have done and we're trying to incorporate it, right? And as we train our models, um, see if we can figure out what, uh, uh, why they're making the recommendations they're making. Sometimes it's just to convince ourselves that it's worth spending the money in the lab, like, like you said, right? So we wanna, does this actually make sense? Um, why is it doing that? Uh, but also, uh, always in the hopes of if something is consistently lighting up that doesn't make sense to us, maybe that's a, maybe it's not wrong, right? Like maybe it's, maybe this is something new. Uh, still very, very early days. Like we, we don't really have anything major to to announce on that on that front. But... So of course in, in, in the public LLM world, the uh, interface is text in, text out, right? So, right. And so I imagine you folks will have text in, text out, but some sort of UX that allows people to put that output in context. Oh, I wish we were that cool. <laughs> I wish it was. I wish it was like a, a, a Minority Report or something. Um, but uh, no, we're uh, but there, much there, more there, in the 
Jupiter notebook or uh, CLI that what you feed in the uh, JSON with some protein. Do you think there's uh, th there's room for innovation in the UX, right? Um, I think we need to sort of first need to innovate in the uh, actual actual models and how to use them, and then once those patterns are better established, but maybe clunky and hard to use because you have to do so much kind of typing then we need to get into into the ux um so in closing for uh there in closing uh there's no reason to expect anytime soon dimitri that someone will type something in chat gpt and come up with a uh, new viral strain that will cause uh, havoc on the world right <laughs> um i i think we can expect a lot of sci-fi literature along those lines um uh, but I don't think, uh, yeah, I think we can sleep soundly for the next few years. That's like that's like the uh, the the scenario that the effective altruists always uh, seem to uh, uh, converge on, right? So it's a convergence of AI and pandemics. Um, yeah, uh, uh, one of the founders of DeepMind recently published a book about that, right? Like it's essentially the two horsemen of the apocalypse: um, AI plus. Uh, uh, plus biotech, therefore, you know, put money in my company. Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, yeah, I, I think uh, I think we're a long ways from that. Yeah, it's 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 great tools that are really effective uh, for biology and are advancing the state of the art, and making a lot of things easier, making a lot of good future things uh, closer. Um, but the sort of push button, spit out a virus kind of thing. Um, we're just nowhere near. And with that, thank you, Dimitri. Thank you.